So, I'm Leela. It's a tremendous honor to be here tonight. It means a great deal to me because when I started out, I, I came to Fr I was born in France, and I was just telling some of you by accident. I am of Iranian descent. And we left the country because a revolution occurred, and a revolution in which we lost everything. And it's not something that I often talk about because I don't think Iran has much to do with my love of literature, although it's connected to it, of course. But the reason why I'm telling you now is because I think it's pertinent to why we are here today. And when we, when we left Iran and we came to France, we had lost almost everything. We had lost people in our family, we had lost things that belonged to our family, and we had lost our country. The one thing that my mother wanted me to inherit as an Iranian child in exile was the love of culture, the love of books. And that began with curiosity. It began with always going somewhere. It started with walking, with going, with asking a question, and with trying to see sparkles in things, you know, ah, look at that piece of little beauty. Look at that piece of bridge, it's so beautiful. There's a bit of sunshine on the bridge. Look, look, look at that painting, you know, look, look, at, look, at, look at the sea over there. <gasps> and it all starts with this moment of being, being just surprised. In, in French, it's called étonnement. And étonnement in Greek is Thomasine, to be surprised. And that's where, that's where philosophy begins. It's with that moment of wonderment. And my mother thought that if I learned, if I had an education, if I was able to learn in books, in paintings, with music, and keep it within myself, then I would have a portable home with me forever. And I would never be, I would have a home everywhere. I would never be in exile. I would never be in need for things or hungry to put things on myself or to look for outside satisfactions. And that's why I'm here tonight, because I want to share with you a little bit of that love, a little bit of that curiosity, a little bit of that wonderment and enchantment that makes living worthwhile. So just to begin, I wanted to show you two excerpts, since we are going to talk about love, and especially tonight about first love. Um, I'll show you two examples of first love, because I think we can talk about, we'll talk about Turgenev, and quite specifically, I'd love to, to talk, we'll have three uh, students, uh, Joe, Flip, and Sosha, who will talk about the book with us, and then please, you're all welcome to participate, but we'll also think about first love in general, and stories, why do we tell stories when we're in love, who do we tell the stories to, and when are those stories literature? And why, why literature makes us better lovers? So let's begin with an excerpt from a film called The Lover, which was made in 1992 by Jean-Jacques Hannault, who's one of the best French filmmakers of his generation. It's inspired by a book by the wonderful Marguerite Duras, and it was an autobiographical uh, story of when she was a young girl living, I believe, in Saigon. Uh, and I read the book very many times and also a very long time ago. Uh, and she falls in love, she breaks all the codes and her first love is a Chinese man and much older than she is and from a, from a different social background, from a different ethnic background than her own. So she breaks all the code and hears first love. So if we can please see the first excerpt. Time, 17 and Playboy. All hail Jean Jacquinot's brilliant new film. Can we cut the lights? One of the most provocative cinematic experiences of our time. The Lover. We are lovers. 
Every day we go back to the bachelor's room. We can't stop loving. He does nothing, only love. Is that what you want? Yes. How many people have read Marguerite Duras in this room? Has anybody read Marguerite Duras? Marguerite Duras. Um, I encourage whoever hasn't read the book to read it immediately tomorrow. It's an extraordinary book. And the movie is good, actually. I don't think the movie is bad. It looks very romantic and very lush. But the book is so much better. And uh, I wanted to see as a second excerpt another kind of first love, a movie that just won the Palme d'Or at Cannes called Blue is the Warmest Color. Has anyone seen it already? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so we're going to see an excerpt of that. So what I like about this trailer is the assertion that it's perhaps the first great love story of the 21st century. I remember when Lolita was published by Vintage, there was, there was a Vanity Fair article that came out and said, the first great love story of the 20th century. And if one is to go back in time, what I'm also interested in in these trailers is that there are commonalities. There is something that in literature, in, in, the, in the field of literature, we call a trope. A trope is something that occurs over and over again that is a common, it's like a common occurrence. Now, what happens here? For instance, uh, Flaubert, Flaubert calls it et leurs yeux se rencontrèrent, and their eyes met. You see the girl in this film, eyes meet, trope. Trope. It's typical, you will have it from Tristan and Isolde from medieval literature in the 12th century to the first, tw supposedly the first great love story of the 21st century, the eyes meet. There is always, there is always a sequence, there are, the eyes meet, and then there's a first talk, and then there's fear, and there's, you overcome that fear. So, um, on, on the one hand, really, the, the notion, the ideal of love and the way that love is talked about hasn't changed very much at all since the beginning of time. Um, if, you, if you look at the Odyssey, for instance, you know, whenever, when, when Odysseus is taken, is taken with the nymph Calypso and the way he looks at her and sees her and is attracted or with Circe, the, 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 the sorceress, it's very much the same thing. It's that magic, that in 
infatuation that oh, there is something almost an impermissible space that you can't cross and that suddenly you do cross. So what, what is love will be our, our first question. What is love? Love can be many things, of course. It can be uh, infatuation. Uh, it can be um, desire. It can be what the Greek called philia, which is friendship. It can be eros, which is eroticism. But mostly, I think, in literature, and when we speak about first love, what we really mean is passion, is that passionate love. Now, what is passion? And does anybody know the, the root of the meaning passion, of the word passion? What does it mean? To suffer, exactly. It's exactly the same root as patience. It's patior in Latin, to suffer. So in a way, um, love is also is suffering. And at one point, um, there is, uh, I think it's, it's, it has, it's in this book or it's in another Chekhov book, because I'm just reading A Month in the Country as well. Uh, a character says, well, you know, I want to, he wanted to fall in love, which means that he just wanted to suffer and be tremendously unhappy. Um, so there is that, there is that element. Um, and of course, in all of literature, it's in first love, first passion, there's an element at times of unrequited love, since since suffering is so much part of passion. Uh, and what interests me most is that there is often, not always, but there's often, like you see here, there's often an element of transgression. And that's another extremely important trope. Uh, there is a wonderful, wonderful French intellectual called Denis de Rougemont, and he wrote a book called L'Amour et l'Occident, Love and the Western World. I really encourage you to read Denis de Rougemont. It is one of the best books I have ever read. It is tremendously illuminating on our culture, who we are, why we write the books that we write, and why we read the books that we read. And he says, the West has been obsessed with adultery not just passion, but adulterous passion. And he, he delves deeply into why is it, why, what is at the end of the day, what is this uh, passion of adultery? Now, it's not the topic of tonight, so I, will, I won't go into it, uh, but, and why are we so obsessed with passion? And, uh, and, and you should absolutely read De Rougemont to, to find out what he says about that it's almost the, there is a there is a death instinct in the passion instinct, and he analyzes why. But what Rougemont also mainly um, explains is that love in in our cultures is always, and I coming from an Eastern, a culture of the East of, or of, of the continent of Asia, I could say it definitely expands also to, um, to the cultures of the East, that there's always an element of transgression. That's why I was interested in showing you these two quick examples uh, that I think each in their own ways, although one is the representation of a novel and the other one is a film, but it's a very literary film. Um, they both represent transgression. Now, usually love can often, or this notion of passionate love, often comes with an obstacle and the transgression of an obstacle. And that is what interests us mainly in the literature of love, that there is something to be conquered and usually there is a price, there is a price to be paid. There is a price in unhappiness, a price in terms of the lives and the suffering of others, but somehow this transgression is also deeply pleasurable. And I don't know how many of you have read Lolita by Nabokov, Yes, and at one point, one of my favorite passages of Lolita is when uh, Humbert, Humbert is driving his car at the very end of the novel, and he says that he's driving on the wrong side of the highway. And, and, and he's driving there, and he winds up crashing in another car, and basically that summarizes the act of transgression. He is going, he's driving counter to the normal traffic. And in a way, I think that when we fall in love, and it all starts with first love, I think for me, all love is always, all, all passionate love somehow is always transgressive. And, and I think we, we all dream somehow of always being the ones driving on the wrong side of the highway. I think that's, that's a fantastic fantasy, both for lovers and for artists. And there's a connection between love, lovers, of course, and the act of being an artist. And that's what I want us to think about all together tonight. Uh, but if we think 
also of the connection between love and stories, um, if we think about what is the connection, what is this chemical? I remember I read my, my, the book I'm writing right now is about love, and it's set in 14 centuries. That's why I've been reading a tremendous amount about the questions as well. And I read a very stupid and annoying book. Usually I adore science, and I wish I could be a scientist, and I wish I lived a thousand years and could know everything there is to know about everything. And I'm, I've been especially interested in neuro, neuroscience, so I was very excited to read a book uh, by a neuroscientist about love. And so she, she uh, plugged electrodes on, on the brains of many X numbers of patients, and she saw what, what lit up. And apparently the amygdala, and I don't want to speak nonsense, so apologies to the scientists out there if I'm just speaking utter nonsense, but I believe something in the middle uh, very uh, went off all the time, and then hormones and all kinds of things. And, and by a accident, I, I had lunch with a wonderful psychiatrist who's the head of Cornell Psychiatry, who happens to be a great lover of Nabokov in New York. And I said, I just read this horrific book that, that minimizes everything to the brain lighting up and chemicals firing everywhere, and this woman says, this is love. And if you want to keep up with love, you know, make sure those chemicals are fired all the time. And, and he said, oh, yeah, not, you know, it's reducing, reducing the human experience to just pure, the purely material. But because there's another element, it's not just the chemicals firing in our brains and the hormones, it's also that as human creatures, we, those chemicals, or whatever it is that begins the affair in our brain and outside of us, is also um, prompting us to tell stories. And that's really one of the things that defines our species, is to tell stories. And not just to tell stories, but to have patterns in a story, what you would call pattern and play, what a great literary critic called pattern and play. And we tell stories to ourselves. Now, I think, especially in first love, maybe, but um, I feel every love is first love in a certain way. And I think in first love, we're prone to telling ourselves that, oh, the other person becomes a character in your story. Oh, you, oh, that person is, is, looks like he's fallen out of the 18th century. You know, he, he, could have, he could be traversing Europe on horses. He, is, he has never been to school. You sort of, you start telling yourself stories and you have a horrible boyfriend, basically, but you, but you, you, you imagine that, that he's the most romantic character in the planet. Uh, so you'd start, you'd, you'd tell yourself stories about the other, but that's interesting. You're already, you're already doing the work of a writer and of an artist when you're in love. You're already telling yourself a story about the other. And in fact, and that's an idea from Marcel Proust, the French writer, in fact, Marcel Proust believes that we always tell ourselves stories about the people we love, so much so that he says that it's our imagination that's responsible for love, not the other person, so much so that when the other person, your loved one, is there, she's actually quite boring. He or she's actually quite boring in reality. And it's very hard to admit that you're bored to death. You're much better off imagining them and imagining that they're so romantic and don't they have long hair and don't they speak three lovely languages that you don't understand and all kinds of things, but the reality is so different. And we also tell stories to others because we want to convince others that our loves are interesting or in worthwhile. And that's another theory. I'm, I went to French school, so maybe I, 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 I know um, the critical uh, literature in, in French a bit better. I'm sure there are excellent thinkers in Dutch and, and, and in English as well. I, I know some of the American and English ones. Uh, there's another one I would really recommend you. He teaches at Stanford, and, um, and he wrote a book. Uh, his name is René Girard. René Girard, and he wrote a book uh, called uh, Mensonge Romantique et Vérité Romanesque. Or Mensonge, yes, yes. Well, I never know which side it is. But I think, yeah, it is Mensonge Romantique et Vérité Romanesque, so it, which means romantic lie and novelistic truth. And in that book and a series of other ones, René Girard develops a theory that I think is one of the most interesting theories on love and stories. He says, we never desire or love alone, one person. There's always a third person involved. And the third person can be a person or an institution or a thing, but usually indicates, indicates to us that that thing is desirable. So excites our imagination and tells us, hey, you know, or for instance, it begins, it could be in a party, at a book, in a book, for instance, where somebody tells somebody else, that guy, he's really sexy. 
you know, and all of a sudden you begin to think, well, he looks much better than he did five minutes ago. And, 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 and René Girard believes that all of desire functions that way. We always desire people or even things. We want to go, what is about it's this whole thing of social media? And uh, personally, I feel I live in the Middle Ages because I don't have a camera and I've given up my Blackberry because I think it was hijacking my brain. But when I look at people taking so many photographs, I'm thinking, guys, you're going to put it in your hard drives. You are never going to see those photographs. Meanwhile, you're spending your vacation with something in front of your eyes. Um, so we're really making those photographs not for ourselves, we're making them to show them to others and to make the places that we've been to desirable, places that, that might otherwise bore us. Let's be honest, sometimes vacations can be boring. We want to, why do apparently the number one thing that's most photographed on Facebook is food? Now that's a mystery. <laughs> why do we photograph our chocolate ice cream? Hell! Uh, I think it's the same thing. I think it tastes better if you think that somebody on the other end of the world is looking at it and envying you for eating your chocolate ice cream. I think ex exactly the same thing happens with a lover. If you know that you're, you're sort of you're, you're, you're kissing a boy that half of your school thinks is the hottest boy in the, in the class, then you're a little more secure and you like him a little better. And Proust, the great writer of, of, of love and jealousy and, and the obsession, the really the obsession with love, the passionate obsession, he says it's all about the imagination. He says that the first, times, uh, the first time he sees... Uh, his, his first love, he says, on the beach, he's walking on the beach, and he says that, in fact, that first image of her, the real image, was, so, was perhaps just a tiny figment of all the succession, the succession of girls that he saw, like so many ballerinas following in succession, but they were all the product of his imagination. The only real one, little whisper of reality, was that one girl seen so long ago on the beach, walking on the beach. All the other ones were his imagination. And does that make, her, make the experience of the one who's in love any less intense? No, that's who we are as humans. We have to imagine. We have to imagine in order to be in love. And, we, and the more we imagine, the more exciting love is. Sometimes we have to tell stories in order to make sense. Sometimes we have to tell stories in order to fall more deeply in love. Now, I'm guilty of that sin. If I tell a good story about the person that I'm in love with, I feel more in love with them because my story is making sense. Um, sometimes we have to tell the story in order to record our experiences or to transfigure our experiences. Writers are, I think, very good liars, but every good lie has a backbone of truth. And you're never as good when you write as when you write the truth transfigured into fiction. I'm not interested in reading autobiography or the sexual life of Catherine M, the book that came out in France, and that was all about the orgies of this woman um, uh, who describes in every single detail her sexual life. That's not literature for me. Literature is transfiguration by an act of the imagination. So sometimes, Sometimes these forms combine, these different stories combine, and in the best, most beautiful, most felicitous of cases, they make literature. But I want to take it one step further and say that there is also a connection between love, the feeling, the transgression maybe, or the infatuation at least, and narrative itself and stories. They're very similar. I think love, the way we talk about love, the way we think about love when we say love, is not dissociable from the story of love that we tell. I think the fabric of love, whatever it is, I imagine it like a, like a sequences of filaments, like DNA coiling. I think that's a story. And I think that the very first fiction in the world might be Adam and Eve. It's a love story gone a little, little wrong, but as all love stories uh, go a little wrong, there has to be a twist in the plot. And I think love is not just a story and a narrative. Love is the first fiction. When we are in love, we are always telling a story. We are already 
the artists of our own fictions. And that's really powerful. It's empowering to us, and, and we, it's such a powerful tool, and that's something we'll talk about at the end of the masterclass. It's so powerful when you realize that you are, every one of us, are artists of our own love stories. It gives you tremendous powers. And with the tremendous power comes also the responsibility that you're not in a novel, but you're now a real human being in a real love story, that you can't just solipsize the other. And so we'll think a little bit about the ethical implication of this, but it's very powerful. I think the real aphrodisiac is imagination, whether it's in love or it's in eroticism. In fact, Proust with eroticism says the same thing. Proust says that our pleasures bereft of imagination would be so sad, would be so sad. And, and not just Proust, but writer, the Mexican writer Octavio Paz, who won the, who won the Nobel Prize, I think in 90 or 91, um, talks about it in this extraordinary book I also encourage you to read, and it's called La, The Double Flame. And he says that the difference uh, between just plain words or rhetoric and grammar and poetry is like the difference between sex that animals can have too, or insects, and eroticism. And eroticism is imagination. So we'll, 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 with the three students here, we're going to talk about first love specifically because I really believe in delving in specifics, in looking at text, in looking, well, how did, how did somebody who had a gr truly great mind, a truly great ear, truly great eyes, how did they see it? And from there, um, we'll go back to we're opening up again to more, more general ideas about love and also about why I think that falling in love is always a re-enchantment of the world, exactly the way that literature is. And that's why reading, reading make, turns us into perpetual lovers of life. And everything today in our culture, the worst, like the best, are trying to make us live more intensely. We would love to live as if we were on heroin 24-7 or in a manic trip, right? But, but the things we do usually are so completely wrong. We think that, we think that if we have $2 million, that will make us happy. We think that if we travel in very you know, uh, privileged places, it will make us happy. But the truth is, the cognitive uh, psychologists tell us that we adapt awfully quickly, and that within a month, if you live in a palace or you have a private jet, you'll be completely used to it and you'll go back to your biological level of happiness. The only thing that will really give that high to you, and I love highs, I'm always high most of the time, the only way that will give that to you is the imagination. And how do you get? Unfortunately, I like, I like fairy tales too. And, and some writers, some great writers that I admire very much believe that all great novels are great fairy tales because they're a work of great fantasy. But life itself, you know, doesn't look like a fairy tale because you can't find imagination in a, in a top hat like a rabbit would come out and, you know, you get the rabbit and you, and you ingest it and that's it, you have imagination. The fairy, tale, the, the fairy tale begins when you cultivate the imagination, and that comes only through the act of reading. I like the movie Blue is the Warmest Color, but I have to say, I saw it three months ago, the impression it made of, on me has worn away. I read a book three years ago, 20 years ago, it's a part of my flesh and blood. It makes me high, it still lives with me, it transforms my being in the world, it transforms my experience of the world, it makes me a lover of life. So we'll talk about this book and we'll come back to, to, this, to this idea.